29 years ago, I stood on this stage for the first time. We were studying the book of Ephesians, and a young Jerry Rushford <laughs> asked a very young Rick Ashley to do a keynote. And I've come back. This is my 31st year. And every year I would say to Jerry, Jerry, nobody does it better. And for 30 years, he tirelessly served our fellowship and gave us a place of oasis and renewal and refreshing and challenge. And when I heard he was stepping down, I thought, no one can challenge the bar he has set so high. I was wrong. Well done, Mike. Well done, brother. You've blessed us. I thought the keynotes this year were as good as I have ever heard. They have been amazing. People have asked me if it's intimidating being the last keynote speaker, especially when the other keynotes have been so outstanding. Well, absolutely not. In the first place, I want every keynote to be outstanding. In the second place, what is the absolute worst that can happen? You will leave saying, I had one of the seven best keynotes of the whole week, right? And Mike, I thought choosing Revelation was sheer genius. Let's be honest. Most of us and most of our churches only have 65 books in our canon. Most of us treat Revelation like my brother's very first book report. He was in the first grade. He had to read a book on whales. He turned in his report. It was one sentence. This book says more about whales than I care to know. <laughs> That's pretty much how we've treated Revelation. Because most of us just have 65 books, but every one of our churches has that one guy who only has one book in his canon, and it's Revelation, and he drives us nuts. <laughs> and so we just stay away. But I'm glad we didn't this week. It's like the physics professor, and he's given a lecture about a very complicated principle. And in one part, a student says, why do we need to know this stuff? And the professor says, to save lives. And he goes on with this lecture, and five minutes later, the student says, how does physics save lives? And the professor says, physics saves lives by keeping certain students out of medical school. And just because it's complicated doesn't mean there's something that's not life-saving and life-enriching in Revelation. And we need to dig there some. And what helped me a lot as I preached through Revelation at my church was some cards I got from my toddler's class. I brought them with me. This card has nothing inside but stickers. Little fishes and elephants and smiley faces and soccer balls. And when I got this card, I didn't sit back and think, now what is the meaning of every single symbol? <laughs> I got the big point. They like their preacher. <laughs> I got another card. Same thing, only this time they tried their best to write their names. What's the deep hidden meaning here? They like preacher Rick. And my last card, the teacher actually, along with all the stickers, wrote down some of the things the kids said. Like, you're a good example. I'm thankful for Preacher Rick because I love him. Thank you for telling us about Jesus. Now, one kid did ask, do you like cats? <laughs> and all that means is at least one of my toddlers is still an unbeliever. So... <laughs> We come to the end of Revelation. And let me remind you, we're not just at the end of a book in the Bible. We are at the end of the book that is the Bible. And the ending takes us back to the beginning. 
In fact, the ending is a promise of a new beginning. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven. I got the wrong chapter. I told you it's complicated. <laughs> Verse 20, chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there were no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. And he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And so a couple, a godly couple, married over 60 years, die tragically in a car accident. Peter's giving them a tour of heaven. He takes them to this incredible mansion. He says, this is where you'll be living. It was amazing. Theater room, jacuzzi, everything. And the man says, what's it going to cost? He said, it doesn't cost anything. This is heaven. It's free. He took him out to the back. It was on a golf course, and it was gorgeous. He said, here's where you have playing privileges. And every week, the course changes to a new incredible course. What are the green fees? No green fees. It's heaven. He took them to the clubhouse, and it was filled with absolutely incredible tables of sumptuous foods. He said, this is where you'll eat. He said, what's this going to cost? You don't get it. It's heaven. It's all free. He says, yeah, but where are the low-fat, low-cholesterol tables? <laughs> you don't get it. You can eat all you want, no calories. You never gain weight. You're always heavy. This is heaven. And at this, he takes his cap off. He throws it down. He stomps. He's angry. They ask why. He turns to his wife. He says, this is your fault. If it wasn't for those blasted bran muffins, I'd have been here 10 years ago. <laughs> now, Why? Why, when you hear a story about heaven, and it has buildings, and it has grounds, and it has food, do you just assume it must be a joke? Because we haven't preached the whole gospel. Because the gospel is more than just that Jesus died so that we could be forgiven of our sins and our souls could be saved. The good news is a new good. The story of the Bible doesn't start in Genesis 3 with sin and a fall and a curse. It starts in Genesis 1. The Bible begins with God's announced purpose to live in intimate fellowship with men and women on a good earth. Question, did the fall cause God to abandon that purpose? Did what Satan do so mess up God's intention that God just had to throw it all out and start over with a plan B? Is that the only way he can respond to what the enemy has done? And throughout Scripture, the message is no. That one day, God will put the curse in reverse. The one who sits on the throne says, I am making everything new. Now, you do not have to know Greek to go to heaven. You won't be able to talk to anybody, but you don't have to know to go. <laughs> this is one of those rare times when a Greek word study actually is helpful because in your New Testament, there's two Greek words for new. And the first word meant new as in it's never existed before, like a new baby. But the second word wasn't new in the sense of time, but new in the sense of quality. Like when you get your kitchen made over. It's remodeled and you say to your friends, come see my new kitchen. It was always there, but it's been made new. It's the same word Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 5. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. It's still you, but it's a new you because of the Holy Spirit. This 
is the part of the gospel we must regain. We know Acts 2. We know that gospel sermon. We don't know Acts 3 and that gospel sermon nearly as well. Verse 21, Peter says that Jesus must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything. As he promised long ago through his holy prophets. And he did. And the prophets are full of this language. Especially Isaiah. Longing, yearning for the new heaven and the new earth. Paul says in Romans 8. Creation is groaning. As in the pains of childbirth. Not to be annihilated. But to be redeemed. Satan is not going to succeed. In keeping one molecule of God's good creation. From fulfilling its original divine purpose. See, what I'm suggesting is that we need to recover how cosmic the Christ event is. Yes, he has saved our souls. He's forgiven our sins. But there's so much more he's done. Colossians 1.20, through Christ, God has brought all things back to himself again. So heaven is going to be continuity Without the fallenness. Did you notice that the book ends not with us going up to heaven. But with heaven coming down to us. What I'm saying is that your destiny is not to be a cloud potato. (laughs) Because when I was a kid I wasn't excited about heaven. I'm some disembodied spirit in an itchy robe. In a cloud at an eternal church service. (laughs) But it's so much better. Oh, the coming attractions are so amazing. But the big news isn't so much what's coming, but who. It's going to be good because it's going to be God. Good is coming because God is coming. He's the star attraction. You and I are destined for a future with God. A future more intimate than we can have right now, even with the indwelling Holy Spirit. Peterson in the message puts verse 3 this way. I heard a voice thunder from the throne. Look, look, God has moved into the neighborhood, making his home. With men and women. Because this has always been his aim. Salvation is not the aim. It's the means to the end. God's aim has always been fellowship. God's aim has always been to live intimately. With his sons and his daughters. Where there is no curse. We are going to live with God. And not in a way where he's a rock star. And every two billion years we get to go to a parade. And his float goes by. We're going to sit at his table. Abraham's going to be there. And Isaac, and I don't get it. I don't, can't wrap my mind around it. But we're going to sit at the table with God. And he wanted us there so much, he sent his own son to purchase our place. And so in chapter 22, verse 3 and 4, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face. You've got to be close to see the face. And his name will be on their foreheads. And friends, seeing God isn't something you ever finish. He is unending beauty. Everlasting goodness. Eternal joy. You don't ever say, well, that's all of God. You'll never lose the wonder. And I believe this is the promise that inspires everything this book calls us to do. Throughout the book, we've heard this word, witness. Witness. And I believe it is the withness that our witness is emboldened and inspired and continues. Some years ago when I was a boy, the most famous sermon in our fellowship was, What is hell like? 
Probably said some good things, but I'd like for us to be known by a better sermon. The book ends with an invitation to think about what heaven will be like. And heaven is not a foggy retirement village. Now, this calls for sanctified imagination. We witness with a sanctified imagination. Because John is using the best words he has to try to describe what Paul would call inexpressible things. He says, I saw a city coming down. Because God likes people. You need to like people. All kinds of people. Because that's what it's going to be. Now, some of us are introverts, and God says he's going to give us our own room. But... <laughs> But I like the idea, I'm going to live with people and we're all going to get along. But it's more than just that. He describes banquets and gardens and trees. The tree of life is back. And rivers. Because the God who created is going to continue to create. And I have no doubt there's going to be animals in heaven. God loves animals. He created them and called them good. He saved them on the ark. He was even concerned about the cattle in Nineveh. I'm not sure about cats. <laughs> I'm personally persuaded cats were Genesis 3. They're part of the curse. <laughs> Do not email me about this. Because I have brought tangible evidence that nothing impure will enter the city and cats are impure. Watch this. I want you to watch how dogs help each other. Now this is cats. I just don't see a future for cats in heaven <laughs> unless God decides we need something to hunt. <laughs> but as he describes this place, one of the coolest things to me is he says, the nations and the kings are going to bring their splendor into this city. Now, just think about this throughout history. All the kinds of music we've never heard yet. And the dress and the dances and the foods and the games and the sports. And everything that was noble is going to be redeemed. And the new Jerusalem is going to have a lot of bling. <laughs> Look with me. Verse 10 of chapter 21. And he carried me away in a spirit to a mountain great and high, and he showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And it shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal, and a wall was made of jasper, and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. And the foundations of the city were decorated with every kind of precious stone. Now, I know some think that's just imagination and symbolism, and maybe. But remember, Genesis 2, there was gold and there was precious stones in God's good creation. Is it possible that the problem is that we took the created like we've always done, we made it idols, we tried to make functional saviors out of created things and is it possible in the new Jerusalem we're going to be able to take created things and put them back in the right place and we're going to sit there and wonder at their beauty and give glory to the one who made them in the first place yeah. well at least I have to think about that the twelve gates were made twelve pearls each gate was made of a single pearl the great street of the city was of pure gold like transparent glass and I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives its light. And the Lamb is its lamp. And the nations will walk by its light. And the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. And 
And so he says, nothing impure will ever enter it. Nor anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Isn't it interesting? That in some measure all John can do to describe our future is to tell us what's not there. There's not going to be any evil in heaven. He says, I didn't see any more sea. In the Bible, sea is a symbol of chaos. It's where the beasts come from. But you don't have to shut the gates in heaven. Even at the happiest place on earth, they shut the gates. <laughs> but not this place. No padlocks, no security checkpoints, no burglar alarms, no policemen. We're going to be rid of all demonic influence. We're going to be rid of the rebellious world system. We're finally going to be rid of our own stubborn flesh. And the only reminder of sin will be the scars on Jesus. And if you have hungered and thirsted for righteousness, you will finally be filled. Not going to be any more death in heaven. I got a call less than two weeks ago. The wife of one of her former elders was in ICU. Her kidneys are failing. She's got a body full of fluids. It was very, very, very severe. I rushed to ICU. I went back. They wouldn't let anybody else back, but they let me back. I leaned over her bed, and she said, Rick, I've never noticed you had gray in your hair. <laughs> this is just my gift of encouragement coming through. You've heard me say before, when I was in my 20s, I could play basketball all night and just get up the next day and go. And then I hit my 30s. And I still played basketball all night, but I'd get up the next day and I was sore. Then I hit my 40s, and I'd wake up in the morning and I was sore. And I didn't do anything last night. And now I'm in my 50s, and it don't matter because I can't go to sleep. I keep having to get out of bed and go to the bathroom. I mean, I'm telling you, <laughs> this is a reality. We can't fathom living out from under death's shadow. Isn't it true? We tend to measure life as a long series of losses. We lost our grandparents. We lost our parents. Some of you have lost a child. Some of you have lost your mate. We're losing our hair. We're losing our vision. We're losing our memory. And someday, we're going to get it all back. In heaven, there'll be no more rush. Now, I know the song says time will be no more. That's not right. There's going to be time in heaven. Time's simply the measure of a sequence of events. You don't have time, you don't have music, and heaven's going to have awesome music. But we're not going to live under the pressure of time. And I'm ready for that. I, I feel like every day of my life I've cheated somebody. I cheated my wife, or I cheated my kids, or I cheated my job, or I cheated myself. I cheated God. Because there's not enough time. Someday there will be. When it says there's no night there, it means time's not going to be a diminishing resource. I don't have to say, I wish that didn't have to stop. I wish that wasn't over. I won't have to say goodbye. When we've been there 10,000 years, we've no less days to sing God's praise. I'm kind of in a hurry to get to a place where I don't have to be in a hurry anymore. <laughs> in heaven, there will be no frustration in obedience. Because here's what I know about me. I have yet to live one single day of my life where I gave God everything he was due. But one day I will. And my mind will only think thoughts that are noble. 
And anything that comes out of my mouth will be true and gracious. And I will love people purely from my heart with no other agenda but their good. And I will serve God with my hands with joy. And I will never pass my peak. And God will finally get what he's always wanted. All of me. And most of all, in heaven, there's not going to be any more barriers to God. I didn't see a temple there, John says. The temple was a powerful reminder of God's desire to live with us. It reminded us of his presence, but it reminded us of the problem because the temple was basically a system of walls. You a Gentile, you don't go past that wall. You a lady, don't go past that wall. You're not a priest, you can't go there. You're not the high priest, you can't go there because that's where God is. But when you read, John described the dimensions of heaven. He says it was just as long and wide as it was high. He describes a perfect cube. What's the only other cube in the whole Bible? The Holy of Holies. The whole city is the holy place. And we're never going to have to leave the presence of God. And let me tell you something. You're never going to get bored with God. This is the rest of the gospel. The gospel is not a pass from suffering. It is a promise that God is going to make everything right. And we need to witness to this. And I suggest we do it with what I call a resilient anticipation. Because knowing what's coming helps us deal with what's happening. It's hard right now. And I don't believe that book was written to promote speculation, but to produce determination. You can't handle evil and pain and suffering if you don't have a good eschatology. If you don't have a strong sense of God's ordained future. Isn't it interesting that most of the best songs about heaven, including the spirituals from our own nation, were written by people on the margins. Written by people who were oppressed. And it was their eschatology that helped them hold on. Watch this video. I was in Africa about 10 years ago. And I want you to listen to the people sing and see if you recognize just one word. Can you hear? Jerusalem. trans sky and these people are poor somebody was gracious enough to kill a chicken so that the Americans could have meat and as they leave our service they walk by each other and they dance and they laugh and they sing hey di Jerusalem hey di Jerusalem one day I will live in the new Jerusalem and they will John says Verse 14, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they might have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. And we've seen it all through the book. Wear your robes proudly. Be public for Jesus. Be a faithful witness, even if it takes you to your own cross. Revelation is imploring us not to love most what's going to matter least. We need to witness to this world by our values and by our ethic. We have a confidence in the consummation of a better kingdom. We don't get our identity. We don't get our security in these kingdoms. It is our high view that keeps us from becoming low lives. You check this in Scripture every time an eschatological passage is mentioned. It is surrounded by a call to ethic. Look at 1 Peter or 2 Peter 3. We're looking forward to the new heavens and new earth he's promised. A world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, 
while you're waiting for these things to happen. Make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless and in his sight. Listen, preacher. A pitiful, weak, pathetic view of our future is not going to keep that brother off the internet at night looking for sites he doesn't need to look for. A puny view of heaven is not going to keep us from holding our tongues or making barriers come down between people that need to come down. It is a robust view of heaven that produces a robust commitment to holiness and a robust view of the new earth produces a strong commitment to this one. And I want to close with this. I believe this book is calling us to witness by what I is call a prophetic participation. And Jesus taught us to pray. He did not teach us to pray, Lord, beam me up. He taught us to pray, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we are to be God's commercial for coming attractions. In other words, we're to give the world a taste of how sweet the reign of Jesus is right now. And it happens all the time. Like two weeks ago in Boston, the picture you're seeing is of two people. Laura Wellington was a half mile from the finish line when the bombs went off. She collapsed in tears and fear on the curb. A moment later, Brent Cunningham comes by with his wife. He sees Laura and puts a blanket around her. He begins to give her comfort. He asks if she finished. She said, no. You don't finish Boston, you don't get a medal. It took Brent many years to qualify for Boston. He did not run fast enough to go back. And he knew exactly what he had to do. So he took his medal off. And he gave it to Laura. And he said, I want you to know I think you're amazing. That you're a finisher to me. Why? Brent Cunningham directs young life in Alaska. And when he was asked why he did what he did, he said, the world needs hope. And my mission is to love God and to love people. That's your job description. If all we did this week is have a better understanding of a few bizarre symbols, we blew it. Revelation is calling us to give the world a glimpse of the sweet coming reign of Jesus right now. Verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. Whoever's thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Do it now. Enjoy the high life now. you got to understand, I so disagree with those who read Revelation as a call to escape the world. I think it's a call to engage the world. It doesn't take great insight to know the world's messed up. And in too many of our churches, we're sitting back in our pulpits behind our walls saying, boy, the world is really messed up. Well, I guess you got the gift of prophecy. <laughs> what happens when the people who are the hope of the world have no hope for the world except to leave it? The world is waiting on us to do more than just passively wait for Jesus. And so we don't give up on the people and the places that our God has not given up on. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is proof that God's future can come crashing into the present. 
and the revelation of Jesus Christ is calling us to go home and partner with a God who is not done. Give the world a glimpse of the high life. And it happens all the time. It happened last month. Two years ago, five-year-old Jack Hoffman started having seizures. Little boy lived in Nebraska. They took him to the doctors and they found out he had a malignant brain tumor. It was close to the brain stem. Two very difficult surgeries could only get 90% of the tumor. But it seemed dormant until one year ago. And the MRI showed it's growing again. So now little six-year-old Jack has to go through 60 straight weeks of chemotherapy. Little Jack, like everybody in Nebraska, loves the Cornhuskers. His favorite player was Rex Burkhead, running back from Texas. Strong, strong Christian. And Rex started getting teammates to wear Pray for Jack bracelets. He would wear them in the games. And a few weeks ago, little Jack, who's still taking chemo, got to go to the spring game for the Cornhuskers. And Rex made something special happen. Watch this. He's wearing the number 22, guys. It is Jack Hoffman of Team Jack coming out of the field right now in this fourth down and short. For the red team. Jack All Hoffman has been adopted really by this football team. A young man who has battled brain cancer is on the field right now for the Hustlers. One more snap for Taylor Martinez, too, who will hand it off to Jack. So Taylor gets the shotgun set, yeah. gives it to Jack. Here he goes. He's got blockers out in front. There he goes. Jack is running to midfield. Listen to this crowd. As Jack Hoffman, the young man that, as I mentioned, has really been adopted by this football team to score the touchdown. Oh, wow. What a moment. And both benches empty. That, that was a moment right there. Wow. Goosebumps. You see, for just a moment, heaven came to earth. And that's what we're going to go home and do. Give the world a taste of what's coming. We're called to partner with God in the ultimate restoration movement. And that's why the last verse had to be. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. The last word had to be grace, didn't it? Because it reminds us that the end of the book is not the end of the story. It's just the beginning of what God's doing. And the next chapters are going to be so be a witness.